So one more example, a very interesting one. And this is one that has at some point or other, I bet, been pertinent to every single person in this room, which is there's another genetic difference that has something to do with a certain cognitive aptitude. And this one, everybody knows about. And this one is as follows. If you have, there's two different versions of this sort of genetic picture, and they're associated with different levels of aptitude in this particular cognitive realm. This is not a world anymore of one single gene at a time, fad to any of these. This instead is talking about a whole bunch of genes if you have a Y chromosome or not, if you are male or female, a genetic trait. And what is the thing that has been demonstrated most consistently in the literature forever and ever and ever in terms of a gender difference in a cognitive skill in math performance. That has come through endlessly. We already talked about it the other week. A small difference in the average median performance on junior high school, Johns Hopkins, superstar kids taking the SATs, but a big difference in the tail at the end, the high performance, all of that. This comes up in endless, endless studies. This comes up with kids at fairly young ages. There is this gender difference on the average. Yes, we're saying on the average. Don't forget you say on the average before you then ignore that. You say on the average, boys are better at math than girls. Men are better at math than women. Male plants in the Gobi Desert are better at math than female plants there. And so we got a genetic trait here being a function of you know whether or not you get a Y chromosome. But then, a few years ago, there was an astonishingly important paper published in Science. And what these people did was look at math performance scores of, I think it was 480,000 different high school kids, and all over the world. They didn't just study it in America. They studied it in 40 different countries. And they asked a very simple question, which is, are there big differences in gender quality of life issues in this country? And there's a whole index that comes out of the World Health UN something or other called a gender equality index, which takes into account like if there is, and if there is how dramatic, of a gender difference in educational opportunities, in freedom of movement, in freedom to serve in an elected office, in freedom to vote, in freedom to choose who you're married to, and obviously the enormous variability on this planet in terms of that. And what they showed was the greater the inadequacies, the greater the difference in gender treatment in a society across 40 different countries, the bigger the difference there was in math scores. It's not a function of gender, it's which society you're growing up with with your gender. What was it the most extreme? Let me make sure I get the countries right here. Who had the worst profiles of the 40 countries in terms of the biggest gender differences in these quality of life measures? Turkey, Tunisia, and South Korea. Where was the United States sitting somewhere around the middle with most Western European countries? And which were the countries on Earth which as a block had the lowest degree of different treatment of people in their society based on gender, the ever handy, wonderful, utopian Scandinavians. So in come the Scandinavians, and what you show is by the time you look at the country on Earth that has the least gender differentiation of any, which is Iceland, you notice something different. There still is a gender difference. In Iceland, girls are better at math than boys. Slightly, a small difference going on there, but nonetheless, as you go from the countries in which from day one, girls transitioning into women are given the most constraints of freedom of life, that's where you're gonna see the biggest math difference in scores. And you look at less and less of those sort of inequities and the gender difference in the math score. By the time it's the Scandinavian countries, it's down to zero, and then you get to Iceland and it actually reverses. It's got nothing to do with your Y chromosome. We immediately come back to the first of those questions from before, that diagnostic question. You got a choice. You wanna have a sense of, in this population, now, even at the individual level, you got a choice. You're comparing two individuals, and you want to guess which one is better at math than the other. You can either know their gender, 
or you could know whether they grew up in Tunisia or Iceland. Which fact do you want to know? You want to know about environment. Environment is vastly more powerful there. Another feature of that that has been interesting, so you then say, okay, the extremes. Okay, so in some societies, the means are exactly the same. But what about that difference way out at the highest level of performance? As I mentioned the other day in the mid-1980s, looking at the highest first percentile of math performance on junior high school kids with the SATs, and there was a 13 to 1 ratio of males to females in there. And when it was last studied a few years ago, it's down to a 3 to 1 ratio. Oh, that's obviously due to evolution over the last 20 years because it's got to be due to genes because it's... Cr that's like saying genes explain the fact that in the 1980s people like wore pads on their shoulders and like power sneakers to work or whatever. And the fact that nobody does it anymore shows that the gene for wearing that on your woman executive decor deal has evolved. It's mutated. That's asinine. You do not go from 13 to 1 to 3 to 1 with a trait in 20 years in a highly interbreeding mixed population, in other words humans, and have this as a genetic trait. Even function at the extreme has squat to do with the genetics of gender. It's I want to know what society the person got raised in. I could care less what their chromosome is. If I want to know how good they're likely to be at math compared to the other person, tell me where they grew up. That's the most important thing to know.